Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Verano. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. Today is December 5th, 2022, uh, and we're ready to begin our meeting. So if you could please call the roll, Mr. Verano, we'll get started. Councilmember Krikorian. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Present. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Price. Here. Councilmember Bonin. Here. Five members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, members, just for your um, advanced consideration, uh, before we call up the CAO to report on items 13 and 14, um, I'm going to propose the following uh, for consent approval after we uh, complete public comment on items one, four, five, seven, and eight. I'd recommend consent approval of the city attorney's recommendation. On item 12, the construction projects report, I'd recommend that we concur with the ITGS committee and approve the CAO's recommendations. Um, uh, on item 13 and 14, I'd recommend that we receive and file those reports. Excuse me, note and file those reports. Very good. Uh, uh, on item 16, Verano. good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome I'd to this recommend special that we note meeting. And file the clerk's report. On item 17, I'd recommend that we note and file the clerk's report. On item 18, I'd recommend that we approve the Office of Finance recommendations to escheat $418,000 to the general fund. On item 19, I'd recommend that we concur with the Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice and River Committee and approve the CAO's recommendations. And on item 22, I'd recommend that we approve the motion. Uh, so when the time comes, those will be my consent recommendations uh, and unless members have um, any of those that you'd like to pull for separate consideration or have questions about. And you can let me know any time between now and then. So in the meantime, let's go ahead and uh, invite the CAO to report on items 13 and 14. And um, as they are preparing to do so, Mr. Verano, if you could please read in our call-in instructions for those who wish to offer public comment today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-655-3266 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so who will be presenting on item 13 and 14? Sure. Uh, You're Wexler. Yes, uh, Jennifer Shimatsu from our office will be presenting 13 and 14. Would you like me to read both those items into the record? Yes, please. Okay. Item number 13 is the city administrative officer reports relative to the COVID-19 emergency response account general city purposes fund status report for September 15th, 2022 through September 30th, 2022. And item number 14 is a CAO report relative to the COVID-19 emergency response account general city purposes fund status report for October 1st, 2022 through November 15th, 2022. Good afternoon, Jennifer Shimatsu with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Good afternoon. Before the committee are status reports of the approved expenditures from the COVID-19 emergency response account for September 1st through November 15th. As of November 15th, the remaining balance of this account is approximately $24.8 million. I'm available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Members, any questions? All right. Um, and on item 14? Um, I, I reported on both of them together. Okay. All right, very good. Um, thank you very much for that report. We'll hold that one on the desk for now. 
And we'll go ahead and move now to our public comments. So let's go ahead and take the first caller. And caller. Mr. Verano, you, you might want to just go ahead and repeat the instructions again one more time as we are preparing to take the first caller. Yes, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-655-3266 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. All right, let's go ahead and take the first caller, please. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Glenn Bailey. I'm one of the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates and uh, item number 21, financial status report. You have one minute, caller. Thank you. Um, uh, Cameron Kikorian and uh, members just uh, wanted to let you know in case aren't others on this call um, that the budget advocates do pay attention to the financial status reports. We do include these um, when they come out on our next uh, meeting agenda. Um, you work rather promptly in uh, agendizing them yourself. So uh, sometimes you've already had your presentation and discussion, but I did, did want you to know that, uh, that we're monitoring these and these all lead up to our annual budget day that we do for the neighbor councils and the stakeholders, which our next one will be on Saturday, June 17th, 2023. I believe uh, Chairman Kikorian has been invited both as chair of this committee and also as president of the city council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Hopefully, uh, if I'm able to make it to that, I won't be attending as budget chair at that point, but we'll see. Uh, so thank you for the invitation, though. Let's go ahead to the next caller. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Kay Hartman. I would like to speak on item 22 and general public comment. All right, you'll have uh, one minute on the agenda item and then one minute for general public comment. Go right ahead. Thank you, I won't use the minute altogether. Um, on item number 22, I wanna say that uh, this motion is being rushed through. Sufficient time for outreach has not been allotted. I request that this be delayed until Mar Vista and Venice have more time to do the outreach that they need to do uh, to bring their communities in line with what's going on. That's all I have to say about 22. On uh, general public comment, I wanna talk about uh, council file 11-1020. F3, um, when this um, council, when this motion was heard by the committee, um, they approved changing the name of uh, the fund from budget advocates to budget advocacy, and they directed the uh, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment to come up with rules for um, how the fund is going to work now that it's, that it will be a mingled fund. Um, and the, um, the city attorney, when, um, when crafting the ordinance, did more than just change the name. They also took the direction to the department and codified it. And I would like to request that the committee take a look at that and remove paragraph C from, uh, from what was submitted by the city attorney uh, before they vote to approve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. There are no other callers with their hands raised. If any other callers wish to offer public comment, please dial star nine at this time. Uh, one last time, if anybody wishes to um, raise their hand, uh, dialing star nine at this time. 
Mr. Chair, it seems there are no other callers waiting to speak. So that phone number ending in 2271 uh, is not a caller? There's a hand up. No? Okay. Uh, all right, well then, sorry about that. We'll go ahead and close public comment on all agenda items and close general public comment. Uh, and we can go next to the uh, consideration of the consent items. Were there any of the recommendations that I had mentioned that members would like to discuss or have questions about? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll on the consent agenda as I had recommended earlier in the meeting. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Bonin. Aye. Five ayes and these items are approved. Very good. Thank you all very much. That will take us next to our regular agenda items, including uh, or starting with item number 21, the FSR. So um, let's go ahead and hear first from the CAO. And then as the CAO is uh, making their presentation, members, if you can consider which departments you'd like to call special, um, and we'll proceed as we usually do. So let's hear from the CAO, please. Okay, item number 21, City Administrative Officer Report relative to the second financial status report for fiscal year 2022-23. And Nicholas Campbell from our office is available to present the report. Mr. Campbell, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, council members. Uh, I'm here to present the second financial status report. Uh, a third of the way through our first fiscal year after the pandemic, our fiscal position remains largely unchanged from the first FSR. As we reported in the first FSR, we continue to face a set of economic headwinds, which can limit our economic recovery. In particular, the ongoing interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve to combat inflation, which may lead to a recession. While it is still too early to project year-end revenue, we do highlight areas of risk in this report. In this report, we identify 88.85 million in overspending, which remains manageable. Uh, the second FSR includes recommendations to address 7.32 million of this overspending and potential solutions to address the remaining $81.53 million budget gap. Uh, we also include in this report a, uh, an update on the status of the American Rescue Plan Act funds and our reporting to the Treasury Department. Uh, for revenue, our October receipts are approximately $37 million above plan primarily due to above plan receipts for property, utility users, business and transient occupancy taxes, as well as departmental receipts and franchise income, which are offsetting increasing shortfalls in documentary transfer tax and parking citation receipts. The documentary transfer tax receipts continue to face significant downside risk due to the compounding impact of decreasing sales volume and slowing sales price growth. Our other economically sensitive receipts also continue to face significant downside risk due to the likelihood of recession. For expenditures, most departments did not report significant, significant changes from the first FSR and continue to project finishing the year within budget or with year-end surpluses. In tables two and three on pages eight and nine respectively, we reported to our total budget gap of 88.85 million, which is 10.77 million higher than reported in the first FSR. The overspending consists of 46.92 million in projected overspending for departmental budgets and 41.93 million in overspending for non-departmental budgets. The human resource, uh, non-departmental budgets, the human resources and payroll project or HRP and election costs. The largest drivers of overspending are uh, fire, general services and uh, the HRP project. Uh, fire overspending is primarily due to unbudgeted sworn salary payouts, one-time budget reductions, unbudgeted contract obligations, staff overtime, and higher than anticipated maintenance and repair costs for emergency vehicles. The projected uh, overspending increase since the first FSR is primarily due to increased staff overtime costs. The general services overspending is primarily due to increased petroleum and utilities costs and increased overspending since the first FSR is primarily due to projected 
increase projected uh, petroleum costs through year end. And the HRP project overspending is due to delays in the implementation of the payroll module and costs associated with the maintenance of our existing payroll system while the new module is implemented. Uh, and there's a more detailed report as item 20 on today's agenda. Again, this report includes recommendations and potential future solutions to fully address the $88.85 million budget gap. For our reserves, our cumulative reserves are just below our 10% policy target at 9.91%, and the reserve fund itself is at 7.09% after accounting for transactions approved since July 1st, which is above our 5% reserve fund policy. And while we report a strong reserve uh, balance, we strongly urge you to continue to preserve the remaining reserve fund balance to the greatest extent feasible to ensure the city is prepared to face a potential recession. For issues of concern, uh, we discuss the potential future challenges related to costs associated with the employee union negotiations and the HRP project. Um, we continue to anticipate the fiscal impact of the tentative agreement with the coalition of city unions to be largely absorbed by existing departmental appropriations due to high vacancy rates in many departments. And the HRP project se section just provides an update on the status of that and leading up to the report that is being heard in committee today. For departmental budgets, uh, as I mentioned earlier, most depart departments finish, reported finishing the year within budget or with surplus funds, um, or at least we don't anticipate that has changed since the first FSR. In some department narratives, we also identified some issues of concern which may have impacts on the departmental budgets. I'm happy to answer any questions on this report, and there are other CEO analysts and representatives from these departments who are available to, and to respond to more specific questions. I also have two amendments to the recommendations of the second FSR, which I'm ready to read into the record. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read the amendments in uh, now, and then we'll start our questions with Ms. Rodriguez. Go ahead with, and read the amendments, please. Sounds good, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the first amendment, uh, amend the first transaction listed in attachment six to appropriate $8 million from the June 2022 uh, uh, election expenses account, number 580322 to designate the appropriate department for the appropriation, the transfer should be made to fund 100 slash 14 city clerk, elections account number 004170. And for the second amendment uh, is to add the following recommendation that the council subject to the approval of the mayor authorize the controller to transfer $450,014 from AB 1290 fund number 53P slash 28 CD14 redevelopment projects dash services account number 281214 to council fund number 100 slash 28 salaries as needed account number 001070 to support council district council district 14 expenses. Thank you. And then as long as we're uh, doing the amendments, I, I just wanted to also add my suggested amendment which is uh, to uh, recommend that the council subject to the approval of the mayor authorize the controller to transfer $3,500,000 from the unappropriated balance fund 100 slash 58 account for amortization study of oil sites number 580336 to the board of public works fund 100 slash 74 contractual services account number 003040 for the purpose of entering into contracts for amortization studies of oil and natural gas sites. All right. Uh, and with that, let's begin with Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question about the, some of the pending FEMA reimbursements and what the status uh, of recovering uh, the expenditures associated with COVID. Where, how is that looking? in terms of all the submittals. Good, uh, good afternoon, this is Melissa Grant's office of the CAO. Uh, we have uh, started receiving some of the FEMA reimbursements. Um, uh, those will not be distributed just yet. We need to see where those funds need to be routed, um, but we still have a bulk of receipts outstanding because of course uh, of FEMA's workload in terms of processing all these requests. So um, isn't uh, just for my education, is 
doesn't it generally go back to the general fund or does it go what what uh well typically where do they typically the get restored typically the funds go directly back to the special funds that fronted the cost however with uh covid uh, incurred a lot of costs, and so there was a lot of general fund front funding as well as funding from other special funds and loans. So it's a little bit tricky to unwind um, because we have to determine uh, where these individual expenditures inc were incurred and whether there was a, a source of funds um, that front funded these costs. So currently in the adopted budget, the uh, it's assumed to be a general fund receipt, and we don't have the uh, we have set off in the adopted budget and appropriation in the UB to recognize that receipt coming in. Okay, and so um, do you have a total of what's been submitted so far? And then can you just tell me how much we've received? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't have them off the top of my head, I'm sorry. May I, may I send that? Okay. Okay, and so we're, and so uh, roughly what percentage of what we've submitted have we actually received because I'm actually excited I I mean I, it's only been three years so the fact that we got anything uh is actually a really big deal yes, uh, it is. but so I'm just kind of stunned but what what percentage so we just received uh, some money at, you know we're we we have more due to us than uh than we've received but I, I would have to calculate that I don't want to throw out any number that I don't feel confident Okay, but it's not hugely substantive compared to what we've expended, but something's better than nothing. Exactly, exactly. So, all right. Okay, well, I, yeah, I just, I'm surprised. I know it normally takes many, many years. It has been a few. Yes, uh, some of these I, uh, receipts okay. are from uh, applications we submitted for reimbursements uh, at the start. Of okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. A uh, comment, but also just a question that when you were doing the amendments, I heard something I hadn't heard. What was the uh, expenses for CD14? What's that about? Um, that was for salaries as needed expenses for CD14. Um, it was a transaction um, that was uh, inadvertently omitted. Okay. Um, let's look into that. And then, and then the this is sort of a general thing, I guess. It's more of a comment, but I get I welcome your reaction. I, I you mentioned the employee uh, raises and and uh, the contract is going to be absorbable by the vacancy rate, which on the one hand sounds great because it means we don't have to budget for additional folks, but on the other hand, kind of is a red uh, you know flashing red flag kind of goes off, and that that just means we're paying more for fewer people to do the same services. And so my concern, of course, is what does that mean for services? Because at the end of the day, we, you know, we want to effectuate these contracts, but we want to do it in a way that does not reduce services. Does this mean that we are reducing services by, by staying in the same footprint, basically paying more for fewer people? Um, I can only speak generally. Oh, go ahead, Ben. I was gonna I was gonna respond to that. Uh, this is Ben Sahel with the CEO. Um, you know, and I think what the way we phrase it in the FSR is that because we have we, because we do have surpluses in departments, departments will be able to absorb those uh, those costs. But it wasn't the intent to make departments absorb those costs uh, at the at the front of the you know at the start of the year. They have just generally because of the vacancies, you know. Uh, generated savings that can be absorbed uh, where these uh, increases can, can be absorbed. But we do have um, a set aside in the UB for these raises as well. So it, the intent was that the set aside would, would be there for departments to use, but because departments do have surpluses, we'll, we will be using those uh, first before we tap into the, to the UB reserve. But we're not, we're, which is great. We're just, I just want to make sure we're not creating a, a disincentive for the departments to hire up to the level that they need to to provide the services. We're still, even though we're taking the savings, where the authorization for those positions is still there, and we still expect and are urging and pushing our departments to hire up 
to do this critical services because we're we're in a in a services deficit at the moment. Yeah, we're not telling departments to stop their hiring plans at all for the year. It just happens that many of them have these surpluses, and and to the extent that they have them, um, you know, you know, later in the year when when we need to actually uh, uh, implement these raises, uh, these uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use those. But if if they don't, if they went ahead and, and hired based on their hiring plans, that's why we have that UB aligned for these raises as well. Okay. And so Look and council it. member, just to add on to that, um, something we noticed, and this really is largely unchanged since the first FSR, is a lot of departments have been using more salaries uh, over time as needed and hiring hall staff to make sure to ensure service deliveries remains uh, and meets those levels that they're committed to, at least in the interim. So in many cases, there have been some transfers to utilize some of their salary savings for that to date. I guess I'm going to consider this then more of an accounting mechanism than any sort of policy or um, programmatic change. Yes, I did that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for raising that, Mr. Bloomfield. I was going to ask the same question, raise the same point. I think it's important that everyone realize that when we talk about that uh, the salary savings offsetting the cost of the increases in the collective bargaining agreements that you know, increased personnel costs. Um, we're, we're talking about ongoing expense um, being offset by one-time money because salary savings, unless we're institutionalizing a reduction in the size of our workforce, which we are not, um, that is one-time money. And so this is purely an accounting um, offset for purposes of the current fiscal year. It shouldn't be seen as something that you know, helps to offset the ongoing expense of, of these agreements because it, it cannot, because we have to hire to fill those funded positions. Um, am I, is that, is that a yeah, that fair is, way to summarize that, Mr. Seha? Yes, it is. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, what we typically do when we have uh, changes in MOUs that happen during the fiscal year, we will budget for those fully as part of the next budget cycle. So, so uh, you know, because these are kind of happening in the interim of a fiscal year, um, it, it's it's uh, sometimes does fall on on departments to to absorb um, if they have you know savings. But in this case, you know, we also have uh, UB uh, line for um, payroll reconciliation that we also plan to use for those instances where departments actually don't have any surplus funds, and then everything will be accounted for fully as part of the next fiscal year's budget. Hey, very good. Any other questions for the CAO members? Okay, uh, thank you both very much. Um, let's go next to our departments. Uh, members, are there any departments that you would like to call special? Ms. Rodriguez. Uh, public Works. Okay, anything else? That's it for now. Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, DOT, please. All right. Mr. Price, Mr. Bonin, any departments to call special? Okay. Um, I will ask um, that personnel stay. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, so if you are here participating in today's meeting and not representing DOT, Public Works, or uh, personnel. By the way, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, Board of Public Works or any of the bureaus specifically within? Uh, Board of Public Works, I think I'll talk to Street Services separately. Okay. All right. So if you were not part here to speak on behalf of personnel, Public Works, or DOT, thanks very much for stopping in. Uh, keep an ear to the meeting, but um, uh, it looks like we're not going to need you to answer questions. So thank you very much. Okay, um, let's start with Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. And I was just looking. Board of oh, yeah. So uh, I can't see who do we have from Public Works. Oh, Paul. There you go. Yeah, I, I don't see know Paul. how come I say, but it's oh, because I signed in on Maritza's uh, 
thing. And so I'm yeah. here as well. <laughs> <I'm a> re- okay. <laughs> Okay. So um, talk to me about uh, the graffiti abatement where, you know, I know we had the conversations previously about, you know, even uh, when we were talking about the Sixth Street Bridge, but talk to me about the expenditure plan, um, where we are in terms of uh, service delivery with, you know, citywide. Um, And, you know, obviously there was some expansion of assignments um, has that been, has that redacted some, uh, has, has the initial uh, hype around the Sixth Street Bridge kind of subsided? What, what I just kind of want to get a sense because uh, just the financial offsets uh, associated with graffiti abatement, which remains important, I just want to get a sense of where things are. Right. Thank, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Paul Roch, Director of the Office of Community Beautification with the Board of Public Works. Um, in terms of the Sixth Street Bridge first, yeah, the numbers have gone down. It's a interesting thing, you know, one, one day, you know, there'll be three or four tags on the bridge, and then the next day there's, you know, maybe 25 or 30, and it's very kind of up and down, but in general, there's definitely not as much um, that's been happening on the bridge as during that first month. You know, a lot of, I think the excitement of the bridge has kind of ceased down. Also, typically as we get into colder weather in the winter, people aren't quite as, as much looking to hang out in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So our crews do hit the bridge every, uh, every day. They're out there about 5.30 in the morning, removing anything that they come across. They are currently now also doing the underside of the bridge uh, where there's going to be a park to be built, but the uh, we're kind of in between contractors at this point. So OCB crews are doing not only the top of the bridge, but the underside of the bridge. Um, in terms of the citywide uh, strike force crews, um, and those funds are in the uh, unappropriated balance at this point still. Um, A report has been submitted. Uh, I don't know if it's made its way yet to the CAO and this committee. It's been submitted to uh, the executive officer of the Board of Public Works. So that should be hopefully coming um, to the CAO and this this committee soon um, because we are requesting that those additional funds for the citywide strike force crews uh, be released. We are still running the uh, strike force crews on a citywide basis. Uh, utilizing the regular graffiti abatement funds. Those strike force crews um, do the high profile, high elevation type of graffiti removal. Uh, They're deployed on a uh, weekly basis to supplement our regular graffiti crews. When we have events such as Christmas parades or the LA Marathon, they go in ahead of those and um, uh, do that graffiti abatement as well. Um, last year, those strike force crews removed about 836,000 square feet of graffiti. We're on pace this current year to re- remove about 1.3 million square feet of graffiti uh, just with the strike force crews. So uh, they're out there, they're deployed again citywide based on areas where we know um, there's additional work to be done or in case there are any types of special events. So how has the turnaround time for removal been affected by the allocation or, or cost overages? Has that been sta- pretty uh, static in terms of our ability to respond quickly? Yeah, yes, there, there, there's been no um, um, delay in, in the turnaround time for requests or anything like that because those are done uh, through our regular geographic graffiti abatement contractors and they're, they're, they, they had no impact um, from from the Sixth Street uh, Bridge funding, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Price, did you uh, have a question for Public Works? Good question. Uh, you know, you referenced the strike force that's been very effective. Now, is this made up of the army of nonprofit organizations that we have out there providing uh, graffiti removal, or this is? in-house or who, who is the strike force and what role are the community-based organizations playing? <laughs> right, right. Thank, thank you, uh, Councilmember Price. Uh, so the strike force crews are 
from one of our nonprofit community based organizations, um, uh, the Gang Alternatives Program, which uh, also has regular crews that service uh, uh, the harbor area, parts of South LA, and uh, uh, the Boyle Heights area. They have um, six crews that are dedicated as strike force crews on top of the regular abatement crews. And on a weekly basis, those crews are deployed to areas that we know either there's something coming up that needs some extra attention, whether it's a parade or some type of event, or um, just working with our regular contractors, trying to deploy them into areas that we know are just continually getting tagged, um, our hot spots, and then also they do the high elevation graffiti. Our regular contractors don't have the capability or the correct insurance or personnel to go up on the roofs, anything that's that's at high visibility, uh, but difficult to remove. So these strike force crews have the bucket lifts. Uh, they, they have the right insurance co coverage that allows them to go up and do the high elevation graffiti as well. How many are there, crews are there? Uh, well, well, there are six, uh, six folks that are um, employed through that, uh, through that program. Typically, uh, they will each be in their, their own vehicle, sometimes with a community service worker, um, sometimes based on, on the job that needs to be done. Uh, or, you know, depending on the area they're in, they might uh, double up and there'll be two, two folks to a crew or something like that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That will take us next to Mr. Blumenfield and the Department of Transportation. Thanks. Welcome. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk to you guys, I, I know the parking tickets uh, revenues dropped dramatically during COVID and, and now we have even lower than projected revenue. Uh, and I wanted to understand, is that just based on not being able to estimate because of all the changes or is it difficulty in hiring parking enforcement officers um, or is it has to do with the diversion to traffic control or other duties? Or is it is it about the policies that have been restricting the writing of tickets? Um, and if it is a hiring and staffing problem, is that also reflected in other areas such as towing of abandoned vehicles? And and I ask this not so much because I'm concerned about the revenue. And I always want to state when we're talking about parking revenue for folks who are listening, the purpose of our parking revenue is not uh, of our parking fines is not for revenue. The goal is to generate, yeah, to get some revenue, but it's it's we're ticketing cars that are in commercial zones, blocking buses, bike lanes. We have objectives with our parking regulations to keep mobility and keep the city moving. So when I see this dramatic drop, I'm not just worried about the dollars, I'm worried about the policies that underlie the importance of parking tickets. So all that's a way of saying, help me understand why this is happening. And uh, you know, what, what are, are those things that I mentioned, are they factors? Good afternoon, Council Member. This is Roy Cervantes, the Chief Management Analyst over at LADOT. Um, all the factors you mentioned, frankly, are part of the part of the equation in terms of the impact on the overall revenue. Um, Chief Hale is actually on, on the call as well. Can speak more to the to some of those uh, operational factors that are impacting citation issuance. Issuance, but it is an um, it is all those things. It is uh, traffic control being um, diverted to other operations. Um, we do have vacancies currently in the department. Um, that we're trying to fill. And we've also been impacted heavily by COVID in terms of the staff as well, be, just being available to, to conduct any of those activities. Um, I'll turn it over to Chief Hale to uh, provide a little bit more context. Yeah, thank you, Roy. And, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Council, allowing us an opportunity to uh, address those concerns. Uh, as Roy indicated, there are a variety of factors that have impacted um the the revenue numbers uh with regard to our enforcement activity we're seeing more uh, activity associated with uh, the enforcement operations of encampments uh the oversized vehicles we're coordinating with the cao's office as you know uh for weekly uh 
enforcement actions, which of course uh, it does require uh, traffic officers to respond to. Um, but as we look specifically though at issuance, uh, the, the numbers really are not that bad. Uh, I think when we look at uh, what we issued last year versus this year, we actually have a slight increase to date in terms of our issuance. Um, the factors which have basically uh, impacted us, so you know, we didn't realize as, as great an increase as we had hoped to with regard to our issuance and, and their ability. Um, one thing I, I would point though is when we look at our special collections that uh, the suspension of scoff law enforcement itself specifically, uh, that is revenue that we are no longer realizing. Uh, since February of, of this year, we suspended scoff law enforcement and, and that generated uh, anywhere from 350K to, to half a million dollars monthly uh, in, in revenue. To, to the city. And, and so I would say that is where uh, there is the most significant impact in looking at our operations. Uh, could you um, elaborate about what, what does it mean, the scoff law enforcement that was suspended? In February of this year, the city attorney um, provided counsel to the department in terms of uh, some ongoing litigation that uh, they believed based on uh, the current litigation that's ongoing and uh, some early indications from the court as to how they may rule that uh, it would be best for us to suspend scoff law enforcement. And scoff law enforcement specifically though relates to vehicles uh, that have five or more outstanding delinquent citations. And so the uh, self-release booting program that we had in place, that has been suspended. We're no longer uh, booting vehicles. We're no longer impounding these scoff law vehicles. And, and many of them uh, have several thousand dollars in outstanding uh, citation revenue that's owed to the city that we are not uh, collecting currently based on the city attorney's uh, advice and counsel to the department. Do we have any towable parking violations? Yes, we're still impounding vehicles for uh, anti-gridlock. Um, our operations that we are providing uh, the outreach and engagement for uh, some of the targeted locations uh, we're, we're continuing those um, special events and you know, work projects, um, the 72 hour violation, those are still ongoing. Yeah. Well, I, I guess now is not the time in this FSR, but I'd like to review the scoff law. I mean, I, I understand some of the motivation of it, certainly when you're dealing with people experiencing homelessness, but um, you want to make sure you're not, you're not, creating barriers that are going to prevent them from getting out of homelessness. But at the same time, uh, it seems like a very uh, blunt instrument to just remove scoff law ticketing. And one that's, that is probably has a lot of unintended detrimental consequences to our city in terms of the, all the policies for having these tickets. So, um, I don't have the answer for it right now, but uh, I do want to look into it more. But thank you for explaining it. You're welcome. Anything else for DOT members? All right, uh, let's move on to personnel then, please. Ms. Brown, welcome. Hello. Um, I just couldn't miss the opportunity uh, to chat with you briefly about uh, the vacancy rates across departments and to see where we stand in ensuring that you have the resources you need to be able to rapidly fill the, the funded uh, open positions that we have throughout departments and, and also to see what other issues there 
there are that we can address in this committee to assist you in in expediting that. So yes, I just wanted to open the floor to you on that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, you know, first I want to say, you know, to my colleagues, the general managers around the city have been so patient and so such partners in, you know, doing some of the things that we're trying to do in the personnel department in terms of filling their positions and so forth. And so um, in the personnel department, currently we are at a 13.33% vacancy rate inside of the personnel department. Um, our goal is, is to reach 10%. Um, but we recognize that it's necessary to fill our vacancies in order to be able to support the rest of the city. Um, and so one of the things that we did that was very, very helpful to us is that we uh, used an open class, which is called a, a, a class called HR assistant. And, and with that, uh, we invited uh, HR professionals from outside of the city to take an exam with us in order to join you know, our professional family here. And so that proved very, very successful for us. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later about why that is so important to have an open class. Um, but anyway, uh, moving on citywide, uh, sworn and civilian, we are at a 20.71% vacancy rate. Um, and uh, in terms of our efforts to try to fill those positions, just to give you some perspective, um, for active certification, so certs that are currently open and we are, you know, filling positions, there are 221 active certs in the city that, and that makes up about 777 vacancies. And I did uh, back out the DWP certs um, so that, you know, we had a more accurate idea. So that's just certifications. Then for TLH, I'm going to, I'm going to, do that a little separately because not only are there large numbers in TLH, but they're also an open, they, they, they uh, support open classes. And like I said, I'll, I'll speak to that in a second. But um, TLH, there are currently 61 active requisitions for, for TLH for 362 vacancies. And so um, what's really, really important about those numbers is that, you know, the elephant in the room is attrition. Attrition is a beast for us. And, and the way that we are set up, because as you know, um, I mean, sure, there are people who are retiring. But more than that is that because we are set up to promote from within, every time we fill a position that is a promotion, we create a vacancy, Right from wherever they came from. And so uh, it sort of makes it difficult for us to close the, or, or lower the numbers um, in terms of the vacancy rate. The personnel department was able to see um, some success with closing the number down to 13% because we actually invited people from outside of the city to compete and, and get jobs with us. And so, but had we been using the personnel analyst list, for example, then all of the management assistants that came off of that list would have just created vacancies wherever they came from. Not that we are not completely uh, uh, supportive of of uh, personnel analysts and certainly promoting from within, but I just want to call, you know, to your attention, you know, sort of what that looks like. And so, um, you know, we are continuing to have conversations internally um, with, with, uh, with each other, with labor, as well as with um, departments on a as needed basis about some of the, oh, and our, and our partners in the city attorney's office, I can't forget them because they have been so super supportive with pushing the envelope about some of the things, some of the ways that we have always done things and, you know, how uh, we might be able to do things differently to the benefit of everyone. So there, there continues to be more strategies on the horizon about how we do business here in the personnel department, you know, how we provide uh, the client services that will be able to close that gap uh, a little bit more. And so um, I'm certainly available for any, you know, more questions that are more in the weeds or more specific to a particular department or situation. Okay. Um, are you keeping any data on the time that it takes to go from uh, offer to uh, getting somebody on the payroll, you know, going through all of the, the processes that, that are necessary uh, to get somebody on the payroll. Oh, you're muted. 
I'm sorry, I don't know that we keep the data specifically, but the data is available. And one of the reasons that, um, you know, we don't follow it necessarily specifically is because there is just a variety of different sort of situations that keep people from, or that keep us from filling a position as quickly, like from the time somebody chooses their, uh, you know, their person to the time the person actually gets onboarded. I mean, um, as we start to get more and more comfortable and familiar with, with Workday, um, you know, that has created, you know, a little bit of a lag because um, unlike, <clears throat> unlike Pacer that allowed us to do the onboarding on the back end, uh, Workday has us do the onboarding on the front end and it has an element for the employee uh, that, that, that they have to do before they even sort of show up. Um, and, and again, you know, we have been doing business for many years with Pacer, whereby not only do, do we do the do we do it on the back end, but the employee doesn't have to do anything until they are here at work. And so um, it's a, it's a it's diff, it's a different sort of a change in the way that we do business, but um, and it has caused a little bit of a delay as we get used to it, um, and as employees get used to like, oh, I'm I'm going to need to. You know, I'm going to need to access online so that I can submit information before I start work and so forth and so on. And so um, but that information certainly is available. We can certainly track it and see how long something took. And um, can you talk a little bit specifically about steps that you're taking to expedite uh, medical uh, and background checks? Of course. So we've talked about that internally um, about, uh, you know, some things that we've tried to do. Uh, didn't pan out because there are the sort of, you know, rules and regulations, uh, you know, surrounding it, but we have made ourselves completely open to uh, suggestions and, uh, you know, other uh, strategies in order to, in order to, to uh, onboard more quickly. Now, I know um, in the medical services, we, we don't have as many issues in medical services um, because we do have the appointments available. Uh, 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 Ms. O'Brien keeps me um, completely aware if she, you know, finds herself in a position where she's running out of room. Um, as it relates to the, to the fingerprinting, um, we have been afforded additional monies this year for more machines, you know, another, another person. Uh, and, you know, we have been trying to you know, ensure that everybody is moving quickly because even after we, you know, buy the machine and after we, you know, hire an employee and train an employee, it takes a while before somebody is like quick and, and, and skilled enough to, to do the job without, you know, uh, additional oversight. But we are confident that we are moving in the right direction with that. And, and when and if any of my colleagues, and this is a part of the teamwork um, that I alluded to early when, when, uh, when I initially started talking, my colleagues know that if they have a particular issue that they need help with, that I am a phone call away. And we always, always make it happen if, if they need to make that phone call. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, uh, Dana. I wanted to you indicated the one of the issues that uh, I know we've all kind of struggled with in this transition from PACER to Workday. Um, how, I mean, even just to start getting a start date has been uh, further compromised and kind of delayed depending on when we're doing the, the timing of the hire and the scheduling of the hire. Um, to what degree do we have any flexibility to adjust it to the same degree that we had uh, been able to do so previously with PACER. In terms, from a user perspective, uh, I know you're not necessarily uh, kind of helping to develop this, but in terms of the application of it, it obviously is contributing to some of the delays that we're having. So can you talk to me a little bit about <clears throat> what your experience has been and how we perhaps inform the system rather than uh, the system driving us? Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I am hopeful as, as well as confident that as we move forward, that this is going to get easier for us. Right. You know, cause it, not only is it new for the, um, for the candidate, for the candidate pool or the, or the selected employees, but it's new for us. And so, I mean, one of the things <clears throat> that might be, if, if, if we are able to provide 
the the candidate with everything that they need in order to in order to onboard themselves. I mean, because sometimes people have problems with having um, the right equipment, so then they need to come into the office, and um, and then there are you know some some concerns about that. And so, I mean, we you know if if I'm being honest, we are still sort of working through it, but and at the same time, you know, working to you know, bring on the second sort of um, module, um, my staff, my, I have an entire staff that is focused on HRP. And, uh, you know, now that the, the HCM or the human resources module is up and running, and we are having sort of, sort of the growing pains that, that you, that we're talking about, at the same time, that very same staff are also working on the second module, you know, so that we can, you know, expeditiously and accurately, uh, you know, begin that. So we probably don't have like the, uh, a, the amount of time that we'd like to have to kind of troubleshoot, you know, how can we make this easier? And so, um, so what we've been doing is just trying to make ourselves available from a client, from a client services places, place, not so much the HRP staff, but from the client services staff to try to get these people onboarded. And I'll tell you, um, you know, maybe we need to move to a model where people still come into the office in order to use our equipment, in order to onboard themselves or whatever. Um, you know, just different conversations that, you know, may or may not need to be talked about with the city attorney or the CAO about, you know, if there are any implications where that's concerned. Obviously, if we ask them to come in before working, um, you know, we don't have like the same control over that if they're able to come in. And, it, it, you know, by and large, people have you know, devices at home and they're able to do the thing. You can even do it on a phone, but it's just about the communication. Um, and, and, and I don't know, maybe, and I'm sort of thinking as we talk about it, maybe that's something that we, that we talk about in an, in, in the, um, the interview environment, right? So that they know way ahead of time that if I get this job, I'm going to, I'm going to need to use my phone to onboard myself, you know, within this much time so that I can expeditiously get onto the payroll. So those are just kind of growing pains that we're ha that, that we're having with this. And I appreciate the conversation to kind of get the, you know, the ideas moving and, you know, so that we can, you know, make this a better experience for everybody. Right. Well, because, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, these engagements often get the wheels turning. Um, and I, but for, for my purpose, I guess my question is, is a lot of the expectation in terms of this remote onboarding, um, is this a, a, a function of, because we've gone into this COVID non-in-person process, is there a way that would be, better, be best facilitate? <laughs> <clears throat> Among those staff that we're onboarding, for example, um, what is the differentiation between pre and post COVID in terms of what that process looks like? Um, and what kind of expectation are we setting for people? You know, because I know in part of the struggle of what we, it's a real conversation that that needs to be had and must be had in terms of who's returned and who hasn't uh, physically into uh, so that we can accelerate this, uh, this work. So how has that been affected by by COVID-19 protocols and what conversations are being had in order to uh, better accelerate uh, the onboarding process and the hiring of the of this personnel? Yeah, um, I don't I don't think that I don't think that it's connected to COVID. Actually, okay. I think that the um, the HRP onboarding model is just kind of a model that thinks ahead right? So it's like do everything before they become employees so that when they're here, everything is already done. I think that, you know, in the, in the years that we used PACER, you know, some people might think it odd that we, that people come to work without being onboarded. Quite frankly, um, in terms of the actual, you know, computer work that is done by HR staff to onboard employees and actually place them in the payroll, it doesn't happen until the second week of the pay period or something like there were only like a few days during the pay period that, you know, PACER was open for that kind of thing. And it was like late, like somebody would already be, been here for a week, which seems counterintuitive. 
um, although that's what we were used to, but we never had the problems that we're having now, right? Because the employee is our employee by then. So now if I need you, if I need, you know, if I need you to sign something, if whatever I need from you, you're right here. Um, and so now we're doing everything on the front end and the expectation is that it be remote, right? So that you don't need them to be in the office or in HR, you know, with a bunch of pieces of paper. But, um, you know, I think that in some cases that that's what is necessary for some employees, that they need that. Um, and it is in those, in, 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 in those cases, that's where we are like really suffering. So, um, again, I think that, you know, to the extent that people know what to expect that way, if they're not able to do something, they can tell us on the front end and we can, you know, have some resources to help them out. Um, you know, again, having computers or, you know, uh, kiosks or, or workstations or whatever available, you know, perhaps at the personnel department for people who are onboarding, if you don't have the resources to mm -hmm. do it, you know, at home or on a, on a cell phone or, you know, through an app or whatever it is, you can come into our office and do it, you know, with us and, you know, and, and over time, I think that that thing is going to get easier, but we are very sensitive to, um, you know, some of the onboarding um, um, issues we're having. And the other thing is that people are, before they, when they onboard and before they come to work, and that's all, this, this part has always been before, is medical and prints, right? So if you're going to do medical and prints here with us, maybe you can also do that other part here with us when you come for that. But that's something that I would have to talk to my staff about, about how to sort of fashion that and make that available for people if they need it. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Price. Uh, Madam GM, again, just thank you for your extraordinary job. Uh, you, you know, you've come in uh, hitting the ground running and shaking things up. And so that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good combo to shake and to, to run. Uh, and so we appreciate you doing that. Shaking and running, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Cannabis has been a, a, a uh, my, my two questions are about recruiting. Cannabis has certainly been uh, an issue that has uh, restricted our recruiting. I understand we've changed some um, the rules and regs around that. Can you tell me what we've, what we've done, what we're doing differently, and is it making an impact? Um, I would say that the changes and rules around cannabis is, is mostly going to be focused at our public safety jobs and our public safety recruitment. Um, you know, there are, you know, the, the I mean, state so of what, California. What do we look at now? A, a, a minor conviction is uh, disregarded or what's the, what's, what rules are we following now? Well, without being really specific, um, yeah. we definitely have changed our, um, the way that we uh, consider cannabis use in the background process um, for public safety. Um, and we have made it, uh, you know, more, uh, we, we've made it make more sense based on what the rules and, and, and the laws are surrounding cannabis. But what's interesting, um, particularly from a public safety place, is that even though the state of California uh, has the rules it has, the federal government has not changed, right? And so to that end, um, we still are governed by some federal guidelines as it relates to peace officers. And so to that end, you know, we can, we continue to kind of, um, you know, have some problems with, um, with recruitment and hiring. Um, in what, this, about, in, what about other positions other than public safety? Well, well, the ones in public safety are the ones that have like the one, well, even if you're not sworn, it's the public safety jobs that are, or, or the jobs that require uh, uh, testing, um, not for cause testing, but the random testing, those kinds of jobs are the ones that are more affected by uh, some of the rules that are related to cannabis. But um, the, the recruitment issues, so the, you know, what you were asking for about originally are mostly in public safety and then very specifically in the sworn um, areas of public safety. So again, you know, a person's got a conviction, he's, he's applying for a, uh, a job in the sanitation or, or some other location, but 
give me an idea of what the difference is or is there a difference? We have we have not needed to change our uh, our background process where where as it relates to cannabis based on non-public safety positions. We have always uh, uh, had the same standard. So, you know, it, it's about, you know, you know, how serious of a conviction, how recent was the conviction? Is there a job nexus? Those, those same questions are still the same ones that we consider uh, no different than before. Okay. Uh, again, on recruiting, uh, you know, a lot of uh, businesses, public and private sectors, looking at uh, uh, qualifications, Wondering whether a four-year degree is necessary, is uh, is appropriate, is uh, uh, something we should keep pushing. Two years or four years? Are we doing any kind of reviews around that, around qualifications, and again, how we might create a larger pool of potentials? Of course, you know the city of Los Angeles has always been progressive in that area, and even in the classifications that require degrees, traditionally we usually we also have. Um, um, pipelines into those uh, into those classifications using experience uh the management aid uh uh classification being the pipeline into the analyst series for management as well as the planning um the, the city planners also have a pipeline through planning assistant or planning aid i'm sorry so the, the city of Los Angeles has always taken that into response into into consideration and and we love the opportunity to be able to um, you know grow an interest in a in a in an employee that you know was not a professional employee to begin with but they grew an interest in whatever you know department that they're working in and give them that opportunity through work experience rather than education a traditional education to compete. So we have several programs that way and we're super proud of them. Uh, and then again, you mentioned uh, recruiting uh, and bringing in, inviting folks from outside to apply. Uh, you, you spoke specifically, I think, in uh, personnel. Uh, can we do that across the, uh, the, city, the city landscape? Can we do that more frequently? Yes, I think that it's necessary. What tools do you need to do that? I, I agreed. And I, and you know, that is something that our labor partners um, and I need to sit down and kind of discuss the benefits. Um, you can imagine what some of their concerns would be, particularly in an environment where promoting from within is, you know, it, we're sort of known for that. And so we have to, we have to be able to have a conversation about, you know, the benefits to the city as well as to their membership for uh, about that kind of competition, you know, that healthy competition to always keep your game strong because, you know, you 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 can be uh, you can be competing against anybody. And so um, I think it's a wonderful idea. I know that it has been very helpful for the personnel department because we have not been internally eating ourselves away by promoting within. And, and you know, we keep a 20% vacancy rate because, you know, I got to get all the way to, you know, entry level before I can make a difference. So uh, I definitely want to have that conversation with our labor partners um, where appropriate. And, um, you know, and I, it is, I am hopeful that uh, the experience that the personnel department has with HR assistant will be a testament to the positive uh, impact that that kind of program will have. You mentioned our vacancy rate is about 20%. Is, is that, uh, or 17, something like that, but is that uh, pretty uh, par or is it way up or way down? Or? Well, that's, that's a pretty high vacancy rate. Um, it is... Um, you know, our goal is to be at 10%. Um, but uh, that, so that is a citywide rate. It includes our sworn partners. Um, but, uh, but it is, it is too high, you know, for, for us to, to do the work that we need to do. And so, you know, like I said, we are continuing to work on it, but we definitely need to start looking at the, the opportunity to bring people into the city and not continue to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, promote and promote and promote, and then it takes a year to get down to the entry level. Thank you, Mr. President. That's all I have this time. Thank you, Dana. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mr. Price. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Um, needless to say, ongoing 
constant uh, discussion that we're uh, going to have to continue to have. And, and I appreciate all of the insights that you shared with us today. And we're always looking for, you know, ways that we can support you in this effort because it's, it's really mission critical for departments across our city to, to be able to hire the people that are necessary to do the work. And um, so very much looking forward to continuing this discussion and, and our continuing progress. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, members, anything else uh, on the FSR for the CAO uh, or otherwise, Mr. Price, your hands up. Is that still up or up again? It's down. Thank all you. right. Um, then if there's nothing further, let's go ahead and call the roll on the FSR as amended. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Bonin. Aye. Five ayes and this item is approved as amended. Great. Thank you very much. That will take us next to, oh, or did I leave off here? Sorry. <laughs> uh, item number 15, uh, the CIFD report. Mr. Wexler? Yes, item number 15, community investment for families department report relative to the basic income guaranteed Los Angeles economic assistance pilot program. So I think we have uh, a very, very initial uh, report on this, do we, or, or not yet? I am Celeste Rodriguez. I'm with the Community Investment for Families Department. I am the Assistant Chief, and one of the programs I oversee is Big Leap. Uh, before you is, oh, pardon me? Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, before you is a report providing an update on the Big Leap program. As you know, Big Leap stands for Basic Income Guarantee, the Los Angeles Economic Assistance Pilot. It provides 3,200 families who are at or below the federal poverty level with children or who are pregnant with $1,000 a month for 12 months. This is a research study. We are partnered with the Mayors for Guaranteed Income and the University of Pennsylvania um, to conduct this research study and contribute to the body of research on guaranteed income in our country. This report outlines um, everything that has happened with the program since implementation, including the application, the selection process, the process for onboarding families and initial demographic information. To date, $33.7 million has been dispersed from this program. And because we did a rolling onboarding process, the first cohort of families who were enrolled in January of this year will be receiving their last distribution on the 25th of this month. In preparation for that, we have been supporting families with offboarding, specifically with connecting them to financial coaching resources so that they're able to manage this change in income. They're receiving reminders. We do direct outreach to families we also coordinate a storytelling cohort where we provide an opportunity for participants to share their experiences and the impact of guaranteed income. We've been connected to over a dozen different media opportunities to let people know about Big Leap. Um, some of them include the New York Times and a longer running story with KPCC on a podcast and various other opportunities we're happy to provide more information about. We also have been serving in an advisory capacity to other entities and cities considering launching guaranteed income programs. Los Angeles is still one of the largest and is seen as an example for these programs. We're continuing to support families with benefits navigation um, and ensuring those are coordinated and we're receiving waivers where we can so that families are not negatively impacted by this program. Uh, and of course, as a research study, um, we are in the process of having USC, who is a, the on the ground partner of the University of Pennsylvania, with collecting information, uh, both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, they've conducted, conducted two surveys thus far. They have two planned for the future at the 12 month and 18 month mark of the program. And then we'll be following up by the following year in 2024 with a report on the findings of this program. We are more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Very good. Thank you very much for that initial report, Mr. Price. I too, just uh, very excited about this. Uh, Celeste, thank you for your, your help uh, and uh, your leadership and your support. This has been a groundbreaking project for everyone, uh, especially on this scale. So I'm, I'm pleased that uh, at least we're 
you're beginning to start to gather the information that's going to be necessary for us to determine how we do move forward, if and how we do uh, go forward. But talk a little bit about the, uh, the storytelling component, uh, how, how that is kind of rolling out uh, and, and how the, the control group, uh, are they a part of that, that process as well? What, what are they, what role do they play? Have they played in, this, in the process? Thank you for that question. So um, what you pointed out is we have both a control group and a treatment group for this research project. The treatment group are those that are receiving the funds, the $1,000 a month for the full year. We have interacted with those families both in onboarding and supporting any needs they've had with the cash disbursement process, which we're partnered with um, Mocafi, Mobility Capital Finance, to disperse that on a monthly basis through cards. The other group, um, the control group for the research um, is directly in touch with the on-the-ground research partner, USC, who's conducting the surveys and doing the in-person interviews to understand the impact of families who do receive this cash aid and others who do not. All, both the treatment and control group, were selected randomly from the initial applications we received, uh, which was over 50,000 applications back in November of last year. And then I apologize to the first part of your question. The storytelling cohort gives us an opportunity that those that we are in touch with that are part of the treatment group have a space, it's completely voluntary, to share their personal experiences with the funds. So of course, we're able to pull aggregate data on the back end about families utilizing these resources for things such as food, but being able to have conversations with participants and share those with the media, showcase to other residents of the city what this program is and why there's value to the family we're serving. For example, a family might have it has explained to us in the past that um, her son, she didn't have resources to purchase the cap and gown for her son or things like shoes. And being able to tell the story behind the data helps with the narrative shift that we're hoping for when it comes to direct cash aid and assistance programs such as these. And, and talk again about the support that we provide the participants when they've turned out of the program, uh, the kind of support and how long that support lasts. So throughout the duration of the program, we have created a resource landing page for the Big Leap program so that um, any resources that are available to anyone who even applied for the program is able to go and see about um, Metro's resources, for example, for low-income residents or DWP's resources for reducing the cost of uh, utility bills. So we wanted to ensure that as these resources became available when we had opened up the application period that we had somewhere where everyone can go at any point to navigate those resources. On an ongoing basis, if any participant asks us for additional assistance beyond the financial coaching that we're connecting everyone to via direct outreach, like text messages and um, phone calls, we're referring them to the Family Source Centers, which as you know, is the city's mechanism for administering social services to our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. It's really exciting to see this come together and as a pilot and see what, what's going to come of it. I was curious about the couple things, but the, the control group, how do we, uh, are we giving them anything? How do we make sure that they stay engaged uh, and, and give them something, but without doing something that's gonna uh, taint the study and make it not a good control group? I, I, I guess this is always a tricky problem, but. Yes, so um, per models that have already been established by the University of Pennsylvania, participants in the control group are offered uh, gift cards for their participation in taking the surveys. And so it, again, to your point, it's nothing that will change the validity of this research, but also recognizing that a family who takes time to participate in surveys or in in-person interviews, that's of course time spent away from their family or perhaps um, their jobs. And so they are compensated for that time via gift cards. Great, that makes sense. And then, uh, and I know it's the geographic dis distribution is confusing, especially because some offices were able to use uh, district funds yes. uh, to make it all work. But what, do you have a geographic breakdown of where the applicants uh, live? Do you have representation in the West Valley? So we do have participants from across the entire city. Every single council district is represented. The methodology for allocating participation slots, as I'll call them right now, um, was based on 
the poverty level and percentages of poverty in within each of these districts, which we recognize there are families in poverty everywhere across our city. Uh, some, of course, a higher proportion than others. So every council district is participating, and I can get you the breakdown for your district. And um, in a former report, we had a breakdown for all of the districts across the city. And to your point, there were additional funds allocated for additional slots in certain council districts. Great. Well, thanks. I Looking forward to seeing, you know, having LA lead the way on this and looking forward to seeing, seeing the results. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez for the report. And thank you very much, Mr. Price in particular for, you know, initiating this process and uh, being the, you know, forceful leader and advocate for uh, putting this forward and really putting Los Angeles on the map uh, when it comes to uh, this pilot program. So uh, hopefully it'll continue to be a great success. Um, and uh, so I think there were recommendations in the report as well about um, to uh, have the council authorize the controller to transfer CIFD prior year savings as well. Um, so if we could, let's go ahead and call the roll on approving the community investment for family departments recommendations on this matter, please. Council member Krikorian. Aye. Council member Blumenfield. Aye. Council member Rodriguez. Aye. Council member Price. Aye. Council member Bonin. Aye. Five ayes and this item is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, that'll take us next to item number 20. Mr. Wexler. Yes, thank you. Item number 20, Information Technology Oversight Committee Report relative to authorizing the Information Technology Agency, or ITA, to uh, negotiate amendment number two to contract number C135368 with Workday, Inc., to revise the statement of work and increase the contract compensation in order to incorporate the changes needed to complete phase two implementation and would transfer $30 million from the reserve fund to fund anticipated expenditures and related matters in connection with the human resources payroll project. Uh, the Personnel Audits and Animal Welfare Committee approved this item on November 29, 2022. Great, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I will also recommend that we, you know, concur in uh, those recommendations. But uh, Mr. Ross, thank you for being with us. I just thought we might take this moment to get a, a brief update on uh, where we we are, uh, because obviously this is one of those really challenging uh, transitions that the city is going through. Um, can you talk? A, well, first of all, it, I, I want to open the floor to you, and then I've, I've got a few more specific questions. Uh, if you want to give a quick overview about why this amendment is necessary. Certainly. Th thank you so much. Ted Ross, General Manager with the Information Technology Agency. I'm joined by our partners and our steering committee in the Personnel Department, Controller's Office, CAO. Uh, honestly, thanks to the hard work of the Personnel Department, Controller, CAO, IT, and all other city departments, I'm proud to say that the Human Resources and Payroll Project Phase 1 went live this last May. There actually are a tremendous number of benefits. We're going from a 20 plus year old uh, custom built system that was actually built on the logic and the workflow of the 1980s and 70s to a very modern system that's a best in class HR and payroll system used by Fortune 500 companies. Departments now use work data on board to manage employees, digital employee records, position control, it goes on and on. Importantly, the phase two of the project which is the benefits, the absence, the time tracking and payroll, those items are coming up. Um, we know that the upcoming implementation of phase two, the city could retire the legacy payroll system known as PACER. And as mentioned in the report, that's critical. Um, I receive my paycheck as do all of you, but it doesn't belie the fact of under the surface, all the difficulties the city has to simply run it. There are known cybersecurity vulnerabilities in the payroll system. We have failing hardware. We have limited support by the vendor. We're currently in what's called the uh, split payroll, which is error prone. That means that there's substantial manual work done by controller, work to an ITA staff just to simply function. Those items would go away with the implementation of phase two. 
The original phase two go live date was set for December 2022. As mentioned, there are additional delays as detailed in the project that made achieving the go live date impossible. Per workday, we're about 80% complete for six out of the seven phase two modules and the payroll module is about 70% complete. The December 2023 timeline is our best and earliest go live date. It allows final prototyping of remaining system changes. It incorporates time for critical system testing, as well as it's done during calendar year end, which is the best time, it's the lowest risk and best time to do a system cutover because it eliminates the need for two systems to run at the same time. Whereas if we were to do it mid year, those are the kinds of issues we'd run into. The required additional resources are expected to range between 20 and $30 million, which includes about $3 million of one-time costs to provide the hardware, software, and security life support to simply keep the legacy PACER system running. These are substantial costs and we take them very seriously and are working very hard across all the steering committee departments to minimize them. As stated in the report, there is a lot of cost and risk associated with simply delaying past 2023 and so we are committed. I'm proud to say that Workday, KPMG, our quality assurance vendor Gartner, the steering committee members and city departments are actually poised to complete the remaining parts of a difficult but doable project. We respectfully request the recommendations as detailed in the report, and we're certainly open for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Rodriguez. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Um, so Ted, can you just help remind me in terms of uh, project lead and, and, and kind of communicate more on, on uh, kind of the, functions uh, that everyone, I, I know there's a lot of moving parts on this and I know the controller's office was lead and you know, you all are involved, but can you just kind of get, cause I, I want to really ascertain going forward, we're obviously going to have some transitions. Um, and I want to really make, I want to be real clear on the expectations based on uh, what we're already experiencing in terms of time delays and cost overruns associated with implementation of this project um, on whose shoulders is the burden of this work and, and leadership of this project going to fall on so that we don't have any further delays that we have, you know, that we're going in eyes wide open, um, but particularly because we're going to be having a transition. So I just want to make, I, I want it to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to miss an opportunity to be like, oh no, well, yeah, now it was supposed to be this way, but now, you know, who's on first on this, who's taking the lead and what, uh, you know, how are we, you know, kind of inoculating ourselves to the best degree possible from having any further uh, cost overruns associated with the implementation. I recognize, you know, when you're, <clears throat> when you're um, sunsetting uh, an old system uh, that was all manually, you know, basically uh, strung together by one person's expertise, and you know, heartbeat that uh, we're we're now in this circumstance. So I understand all of the complications associated with the transition of this work, but um, but I know the leadership of uh, and the decision making process of uh, keeping this thing moving is critical so that we can avoid further cost overruns. So can you kind of help uh, refresh my memory in terms of you know? Who's in the room? How are these decisions being made? And uh, what? how are we best going to protect ourselves from any, any further uh, um, requests for uh, more investment? Absolutely, that's a very good question. Uh, and I'm also reminded of the fact that we're not only implementing a new system to your point, we're implementing a new system and processes that is catching the city up for decades. This is decades worth of improvements, um, which is being done, mind you, during the COVID-19 pandemic. This project started at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So the work is being done remotely. The work, while challenging and unique and different, while coordinating 40 plus departments, all of which being done generally remotely uh, as much as possible. Uh, so when it comes to project leadership, the Information Technology Agency per council is the identified project manager. So we manage the project. So we manage the project plan. We work closely with workday and departments on that. We help manage the budget, et cetera. But with that being said, 
we are an IT department. So while we may know the technology and we may know IT project management and how to deliver on a project, we have to rely heavily on business process owners. The controller is the business process owner of the city's payroll function. The personnel department is the business process owner of human resource functions. So we work very closely, as you can imagine, with personnel to get us to the HCM or the human capital management phase one go live. And now we work a lot with the controller's office when it comes specifically around payroll. On top of that, the CAO plays a role as a business process owner around employee roles and responsibilities and compensation. And so going from a traditional old fashioned system to a modern one, it challenges departments to take a leadership role in their key processes, much as a finance or an HR department plays those roles in a private sector business. So everyone becomes very aware Training is done across all these different departments. We have ownership. They walk through all these different items. They are parts of prototyping. They do the testing and they make configuration changes. So while we may be in the IT department running the project and we may be handling the technical, the interfaces, the reports, et cetera, a huge role is played by the controller, the personnel, and others. That being said, when it comes to questions around insulating and ensuring that we can get this last year and get it done, we work very closely with middle and lower management. What do I mean by that? There are assigned controller and personnel and CAO staff on this project, and those are staff who are not a part of the transition. There may be, let's say, a new controller, for example, but that is a, a, an elected leader and a manager who, A, we start with working with them to bring them up to speed on where we are with the project and how to deliver success on this project. But B, we have a, a transition and a continuity of the staff who continue to do the work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. I think you kind of thoroughly covered some of the stuff that I was going to ask about. And uh, Ted, I appreciate the the update. This is just this is an amendment that's before us. It's another significant investment, but I think you've given a um, you know, really insightful look at why this is so mission critical and also the costs that we're bearing right now uh, each month that we haven't completed this project uh, because of the status of, of PACER. So um, really appreciate your leadership on this. Uh, thanks very much. Let's go ahead and uh, open the roll on the recommendations. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Bonin. Councilmember Bonin. He's giving a thumbs up. Thumbs His up. mute's not able to. Five <laughs> eyes, and this item is approved. Very good. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Verano, according to my notes, that concludes our open session items. Is that right? That is correct, Mr. Chair. All right, let's go ahead and prepare the room for closed session then, please. Okay, one moment, please. Closed session items. And uh, just before we adjourn, I probably should have said this when we had 120 budget interested people still on the line uh, rather than now. But uh, I do just want to take a moment uh, to note that this will likely be my last budget committee meeting as as chair after over a, a decade of doing this work and I we have obviously been through tremendous ups and downs in this committee over the course of that time going through the city's two greatest recessionary periods in in its history uh, at least since the great depression and managing this in a way that um, allowed the city not only to avoid devastation but to end up building up the strongest reserves and it's ever had and improving our bond trading condition and in every other way, uh, stabilizing the city. We've grown our workforce um, and uh, we've done all of this work in a way that I think has helped to open this process up to the public and help the public to understand our budgeting and, and how important it is and to and to hold the public's trust around our budget as well. And that, that has been singularly the work of uh, the members of this committee, uh, present and past, 
and their extraordinarily committed staffs who have done so much to make these very difficult labor intensive meetings uh, work uh, to the extraordinary people uh, that work in the CLA's office, uh, of course, uh, Sharon So and Karen Kalfayan and Andrea Galvin and uh, before uh, Roy Morales and and many others and the the CAOs that that we've worked under uh, Miguel Santana and Richard Llewellyn and Matt Zabo and uh, our representatives of the CAOs office who work so much with us notably including Jacob Wexler Ben Seha and Ray Serrano before that. Um, to our clerks, uh, all of our clerks uh, who have kept these meetings running, I, I really want to uh, thank you all very much. And Mr. Verano, you are uh, the the last in a long line of uh, great assistants who have helped us uh, move forward with these uh, meetings. And those folks uh, have included, of course, Andrew Suh, Mandy Morales, Andrew Choi, Richard Williams, and Erica Polst. Um, I really want to say uh, thank you to all of you and to the men and women of the city attorney's office too for all that we do together. Um, this has been really a great privilege to be able to work with all of you uh, and to my staff, to all of your staff. We're really grateful to, to all the work that you've done. So um, with that, I just want to thank you all. And Mr. Krikorian? Yes. I managed Good to get month. back on and I heard the end of your announcement and I, I just wanted to chime in uh, to thank you. Uh, I guess it was inevitable that you were going to have to step down from the budget committee, but it is uh, sad and unimaginable nonetheless. Uh, you have been an incredible uh, steward of the city's finances and a remarkable, remarkable chair of this committee, one for, uh, one for the history books. And I just want to thank you. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you, Mike. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield, I, I didn't really want to do this, but Mr. Blumenfield. Want to do this. We, won't, we won't do a big thing right now on this, but but certainly I, I, I echo those comments. And I also know that uh, regardless, you're going to be part of the budget process as council president. So Indeed. we're not really saying goodbye to you, but we are saying goodbye to Mike uh, because... Yes. He's been on this budget committee, I know just recently again, but for many years, and uh, we want to give him some kudos as well as this is uh, even more likely to be his last budget committee meeting than, than your last budget committee meeting. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we have an emergency meeting uh, the next week. But, uh, you know, Mike, thank you, too, for, for all the great work that you've been. You've been a great team player on this committee as well. Uh, you know, you've both been... Uh, really amazing in helping bring the city together. I know this is a, has been a tricky time for many years and uh, I'll, I won't do a long thing, but I'll leave it at that. So thank you both. And thank you for saying that uh, Mr. Blumenfeld, because in fact, Mike has, it is the veteran among all of us uh, because even before he was a member of this committee, he staffed council member Rosendahl on this committee. And so he came he came before any of us. Uh, and so thank you, Mike, for your long years of service. Mr. Price. Thank you. I just want to also salute both of you for your for your years of service. Uh, Paul, you've been a stingy chair. <laughs> that's, what you want. that's what you want for the for budget. Uh, and Mike, you've been watching every penny also. Uh, but, you know, it just underscores the fact that it really takes a team effort. These have been some difficult, challenging times, and uh, we're all trying to make the best of a bad situation. So congratulations to both of you as you move on. Well, thank you very much. And with that, members, uh, if there's if there's nothing further, <laughs> Krikorian out. <laughs> thank you very much. We are adjourned. Mr. Chair, uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I have um, something to report in the open session from closed session before we adjourn. Mm, uh, I don't think so. Uh, just for the two city attorney recommendations on items 10 and 11. Uh, is that, do we still have somebody, Mr. Fobler, are those reportable? Is that reportable I, I, action? I believe they are because they're, they're okay. contract matters, yes. So just for the yes. record, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay, wow. <laughs> sorry. What, what a buzzkill. So sorry about that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
For the record, the city attorney rec recommendations for items 10 and 11 were approved in closed session. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you for your kind words. Thank you. All right, very good. With that, members, thank you all very much. The Budget and Finance Committee is adjourned. Thank you.